Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. All across the globe, our executive committee members are watching and church members. And what a privilege it is to greet you who are watching on electronic transmission, live streaming, and to greet my brothers and sisters here in the auditorium. You see, this is a very different annual council. It is a hybrid annual council. We have in our audience seated representatives from many of the divisions, division officers. Thank you for being here. Some of you officers could not come because of travel restrictions, other difficulties, but we welcome all of you to this 2021 annual council. In some way, this will also be a good practice run for the general conference session that we, by God's grace, will be having June 6 to 11, 2022 in St. Louis. There may be a number of you as delegates who will not be able to attend on site. By God's grace, we hope to have electronic connection for you as well. But you know, we have to adapt in these very changing times. That's why, brothers and sisters, as we've had a wonderful beginning to our annual council already, beautiful Sabbath school this morning, and uh, the lead conference, which was so inspiring and encouraging to all of us, that's why as we focus on mission in these challenging times, we need to say, give me the Bible. I invite you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, following the verses that were just read as our scripture reading. And reading on, beginning with verse 19 to the end of the chapter. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, that wonderful passage takes center focus in this message today. What we just read follows the scripture reading of the previous verses focusing on the reliability of the word of God. And what a privilege to be part of God's last day Advent movement, hurtling towards the impending conflict and the soon coming of Jesus Christ as explained in his word. Now, the culmination of the great controversy between Christ and Satan is upon us, and thus, the impending conflict. Let me pose the question, are you ready? Today, I share with you as spiritual leaders and church members worldwide a somewhat lengthy pastoral message. This message comes from my strong personal spiritual convictions. And I humbly share it with you. In fact, our church members long to hear messages regarding conviction and affirmation for the biblical beliefs of our Advent movement. When you preach, my fellow leaders, when you give those messages, I urge you to give the trumpet a certain sound. We had a beautiful trumpet this morning in our song service for Sabbath school. Give it the sound of heaven and its final messages of Bible truth. Now, I want to tell you, the devil is busy bringing in all types of aberrant beliefs, which we will review in this message. Not all of them, but a number of them. 
but we are to look only to Christ and his holy word as we proclaim the three angels' messages. And during annual council, we're going to be focusing again on those three angels' messages. Now, as Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20 tells us, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. I want to urge you to accept and follow truth only according to the word, according to God's word, according to his word. Living according to his word is even more meaningful as we experience the strange and deadly COVID-19 pandemic. People know something unusual is happening, and they wonder if the end of the world is at hand. Well, actually, it is. We're living in times of intense change and have been told the final movements would be rapid ones. There is no doubt in my mind that we are facing the end of time. What an opportunity to be part of total member involvement and tell the Lord, yes, I will go and be part of proclaiming your three angels' messages with Holy Spirit power. Weren't you moved by that amazing testimony in our lead conference by Sister Enir Nascimento from Brazil, where she was providing Bible studies through her telephone, and she was wearing a particular blouse or shirt that said, I will go, and she said, she made the remark, it says, I will go, but I already went. I mean, praise God for those who are actively involved in total member involvement. Now, my fellow leaders and church members, keep your focus on the Bible. Don't allow strange voices to confuse what we believe. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 to 5 states, it states, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourselves. I want to urge you to stay away from those who are proclaiming strange beliefs and aberrations of Bible truth. We have strong biblical foundational truths given to us by God from the beginning of our Advent movement to be delivered to the world. As Christ said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Now, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, told us in the scripture reading that we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 19 says, we have the prophetic word confirmed. Verse 20, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Verse 21, prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, my fellow leaders, and I counted you, there are about 95 of us in this auditorium today. It's a far cry from two years ago when we had annual council in this room. We're all socially distanced, uh, trying to be careful, but it's a little improvement on last year. 
by God's grace, we still, by his grace, may be together again. But let me tell you, this pandemic, even though it is miserable, is nothing compared to what we will face. But God will go with us through the storms, as we have learned in our lead conference. But unfortunately, my fellow leaders, there are people who do not believe what we have just read. They seem to use the horribly self-centered historical critic or higher criticism approach, placing their own private interpretation on what the Bible says. Now, please understand, Seventh-day Adventists believe in the historical grammatical, the historical biblical approach, allowing the Bible to interpret itself, line upon line, precept upon precept, verse upon verse. We believe in the historicist approach to prophecy, not the preterist, not the futurist approaches. The historical, biblical, hermeneutical method is the only method accepted by the Seventh-day Adventist church. Do not allow any other methods of biblical interpretation to be used in your churches, institutions, or activities. Methods other than God's approved methods, line upon line, verse upon verse, precept upon precept, will only lead, other than that, they will lead to absolute ruin and confusion and will lay the foundation for easy acceptance of the mark of the beast signifying the mixing of truth with error. We have a sure word of prophecy indicated in the King James Version or in the New King James Version. We have the prophetic word confirmed. Now, the theological pillars of the, of the Seventh-day Adventist movement, God's Advent movement, are solid and founded on God's word. His word is sure and rock solid. If this pastoral message can touch your heart, I pray that God will use in this pastoral message an opportunity for us to explore some of the faith-destroying theological aberrations floating around these days, absolutely connected with Babylon, confusion, and from the devil himself. And we will then focus on what our primary mission is, lifting up Christ, his righteousness, his three angels' messages, his word, and his soon coming. Now, we should expect these aberrations since it's the time of shaking as recorded in last day events page 173. We are in the shaking time, the time when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. The Lord will not excuse those who know the truth if they do not in word and deed obey his commands. So what are some of these aberrations that so blatantly and grossly misrepresent God and his word? I share with you a list of 14, which are certainly not, this is certainly not an, exa an exhaustive list. Number one, the word of God not accepted as authoritative. Now, some say, don't worry about the words in the scripture, just get the principles. What a disastrous delusion. This concept is produced by the father of all lies, Satan himself. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every Good work. In Revelation chapter 22 and verses 18 and 19, we read, 
for I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Now clearly, the words of God are absolutely essential. Seventh-day Adventists believe in thought inspiration, not verbal inspiration. So don't confuse what I am telling you. The words are important. God allowed the prophets to use words portraying God's message. Do not try to change them or speculate using your own private interpretation. I've even heard of an attempt to question the reliability of 66 books of the Bible canon, suggesting we need to look at non-canonical, apocryphal books to perhaps broaden our view on truth. My fellow leaders, scholars, and church members reject this type of syncretistic approach blending current cultural and societal thinking into the Word of God. That approach is not the truth of God tested over the centuries. God's truth is anchored in his careful revelations, and we have a sure word of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy indicates we should read the Bible as it reads. Christ Triumphant, page 226, says, the most learned men in the days of Christ, philosophers, legislators, priests, in all their pride and superiority, could not interpret God's character. The earth was languishing for a teacher sent from God. But when he came just as the living oracles specified he would come, the priests and instructors of the people could not discern that he was their savior, nor could they understand the manner of his coming. Now listen to this. This is really powerful. Unaccustomed to accept God's word exactly as it reads or to allow it to be its own interpreter, they read it in the light of their maxims and traditions. So long had they neglected to study and contemplate the Bible that its pages were to them a mystery. They turned with aversion from the truth of God to the traditions of men. My fellow leaders and members, all of you watching, I want to urge you to have complete Trust in the Bible according to his word. Number two, the attempts to diminish the spirit of prophecy. Now, Ellen White predicted that there would be attempts to destroy God's work through her. In Testimonies to Ministers, page 51, she states, the result of such work will be unbelief in the testimonies. And as far as possible, they will make of none effect the work that I have for years been doing. People do this by ignoring the spirit of prophecy, challenging the spirit of prophecy, or actually contradicting the spirit of prophecy. You see, the spirit of prophecy, in my opinion, was given by God through Ellen White as special instructions to God's last day church and is verified by Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 19, verse 10. The spirit of prophecy is absolutely reliable 
and is to be believed and accepted in its entirety. Ellen White was absolutely a prophet of God. And her ministry, including strong messages from the throne room of God about apocalyptic prophecy and instruction, are for all time. As we read the spirit of prophecy, we're convicted of its accuracy, its truthfulness, its relevancy. My dear friends, make no apologies for using or promoting the spirit of prophecy and its heavenly counsel. It is a heaven-sent gift of God to the Seventh-day Adventist church and to the world. I firmly believe Ellen White was inspired by God. The spirit of prophecy is according to his word. Now, the third item is misconceptions about justification and sanctification. Christ's righteousness encompasses his justifying and sanctifying power and is at the very core of the three angels' messages. It is through Christ's justification, that we can be righteous in the Father's eyes. Just as I remarked in Sabbath school, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, one of the most magnificent verses that encapsulates the plan of salvation. It is through Christ's sanctification that we can keep the commandments of God. Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 14, 12, part of what we consider the three angels' messages, indicate that God's people at the end of time, and that's where we are right now, would be keeping the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. It was predicted. Christ's righteousness through justification and sanctification is beautifully outlined in Steps to Christ, pages 62 and 63, and I urge you to read the entire part. But here is a passage from it. We have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God, but Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such as we have to meet. He lived a sinless life life. He died for us, and now he offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. Read the portions in between, but now jumping a little bit ahead. More than this, Christ changes the heart. <clears throat> he abides in your heart by faith. You are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will to him. And so long as you do this, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Then, with Christ working in you, you will manifest the same spirit and do the same good works, works of righteousness, obedience. So, and this is such a powerful ending that Ellen White writes, so we have nothing in ourselves of which to boast. Our only ground of hope is in the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, justification by faith, and in that wrought by his spirit working in and through us. Sanctification. Let's accept the all-encompassing righteousness of Christ according to his word. Number four, denial of the urgency of the times. Now in this end time, many do not understand the urgency needed and believe they cannot do, believe they can't do anything about the return of Christ. However, the Lord says we can hasten his coming. Second Peter 3, 10 through 12 indicates the following. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in 
holy conduct and godliness, looking for the coming of the day of God. By God's grace, in total member involvement, we can hasten Christ's coming. Don't pay attention to strange voices that may say, we can't understand prophecy and our current setting will just continue as it is. And none of us, I would tell you, should predict when Jesus will come. However, in the Bible, God has provided many signs indicating Jesus' return. We are very close. As part of the Advent movement, you, every one of you, are vital instruments in God's hands in your division, in your union, your local field, your local church, and in the family to hasten the coming of the Lord according to his word. Number five, humanism versus heavenly inspiration. Now, the onslaught of humanism in culture today has nearly obliterated the understanding that supernatural inspiration is overwhelmingly more powerful than any humanistic philosophy. Teach people to value the power of God and his word in guiding us in all things and to respect, to reject, I should say, humanism completely. Now, in Matthew 15, verses 8 to 9, Jesus quoted from Isaiah 29, verse 13, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So my fellow leaders, fight against humanism and lift up heavenly inspiration according to his word. Number six, disregard for the sanctuary service and the gospel message. There are those who have no regard or understanding of the beauty of the sanctuary and its services, which point to the gospel, the lamb slain on the cross. We read in Last Day Events, page 177. The enemy will bring in false theories such as the doctrine that there is no sanctuary. This is one of the points on which there will be a departing from the faith. So I urge you, promote and teach the sanctuary doctrine with Christ, his righteousness, and the everlasting gospel at the center. Biblical prophecies are real, and Daniel 8, 14 is absolutely rock solid. Don't believe anybody who says, oh no, that was only 2,300 literal days, and it ended with someone called Antiochus Epiphanes. No, my friends, don't believe that. We have the biblical day-year principle given to interpret prophecy. Allow the Bible to interpret itself. The historicist approach shows us that history has accurately unfolded according to his word. Number seven, ecumenism versus the shaking and sifting of God's church. I strongly urge you, to stay away from ecumenism. Instead, focus on the proclamation of the three angels' messages. Believe what the great controversy says about the end time setting, when the shaking and sifting of the church will take place. Yes, we're to make friends with people, but we're never to compromise and engage in religious ecumenical activity. The time will come when we will face terrible oppression, horrible oppression. So now we must never compromise in the least on our beliefs and doctrines. Now, last day events, 
page 180, tells us, Soon, God's people will be tested by fiery trials, and the great portion of those who now appear to be genuine and true will prove to be base metal. That is a shocking statement. I, I hope every one of us, by God's grace, will not be part of that group, which shows us to have nothing as a foundation. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless, it must take place. My brothers and sisters, stay faithful to our heavenly beliefs according to his word. Number eight. Congregationalism versus God's worldwide Seventh-day Adventist remnant church. There are those who wish to focus only on local church and community settings, ignoring the worldwide family of Seventh-day Adventists in about 215 countries of this globe. While the local church and community are vitally important, we are a worldwide family of believers who love and support each other. If we focus on others and their needs, including financial, we will be blessed at home beyond measure. Look at this incredible statement. In fact, it was referenced somewhat during our Sabbath school this morning. Testimonies, volume 6, page 27, indicates the following. The home missionary work will be farther advanced in every way when a more liberal, self-denying, self-sacrificing spirit is man manifested for the prosperity of foreign missions, for the prosperity of the home. This is a really important part of the sentence. For the prosperity of the home work depends largely under God upon the reflex influence. Leaders, don't ever forget that beautiful combination of two words. The reflex influence of the evangelical work done in countries afar off. So fellow believers, think and act globally as well as locally. That's a message from our Sabbath School Personal Ministries Department. God will bless your witness and your stewardship, faithfulness, as you help others far beyond your borders. Stay close to this wonderful world church family and be blessed by God according to his word. Number nine, attacks against the Godhead. Now, there are those who advocate that the Godhead is not three distinct persons, thus diminishing God. We know from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that there is absolutely a Godhead made up of three persons united in one. Now, can I explain that? No, but I believe it by faith. The Bible indicates the three persons of the Godhead have existed from eternity to eternity. They were present at creation, at the baptism of Christ, and will be with us forever. In fact, Matthew 28, 19 tells us to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. My fellow leaders and church members, the Godhead is three persons according to his word. Number 10. Opposition to God's law and his Ten Commandments. Now, there are those who will say the law has been done away with. However, God's law is eternal. We do not keep God's law, the Ten Commandments, through our own power, but only as we lean on Christ and his righteousness. Again, last day events. You can tell I really like that book. I hope it's a familiar one and a favorite of yours. Page 180 indicates, when the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. 
to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. Fellow leaders and church members, give praise to God for his law according to his word. Number 11, evolution versus biblical creation. The devil has attempted to obliterate all references to God's authority as the creator, including the erroneous idea that the earth evolved over billions of years. Cliff this morning gave tremendous uh, emphasis to the need to understand that Adam and Eve were real, that the earth is really not that old, and that God actually created. I want to tell you both evolution and theistic evolution are opposed to the account of creation found in the Bible and enunciated in the spirit of prophecy. The global flood, also denigrated by non-believers, is another indication of God's power and authority to remake the world. Anything revealing God's power and authority is challenged by the devil. However, what God does is always good. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31 says, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God recently made this earth in six days and rested on the seventh day, which he made holy reminding us of his creative and redemptive power, which was all done according to his word. Six literal days. Number 12, aberrant lifestyle behavior versus biblical view of sexuality. You know, God created Adam and Eve, the first family, telling them in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, be fruitful and multiply. Aberrations to God's original plan have come from the devil, so now there are many sexual lifestyles which are opposed to God's original plan and are not part of his purpose for human beings. Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, they clearly state the following. For even their women exchange the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. The rampant sexual aberrations in the world are not condoned by the Bible and will not lead to eternal life. Sexual immor immor immorality in any form is to be changed through God's power working in the life. God's ideal is to be followed, again, through his power to put us in a right relationship with his moral and natural laws. This is not an impossibility, for the Bible clearly states in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, the following. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, 
but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What a precious promise we have. We can be washed and changed by the mighty power of heaven. Now, this subject is a delicate one. And I want to tell you, fellow leaders and church members, we cannot be silent on what the Bible teaches as correct living and practice. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has carefully studied these topics and has issued voted statements by representatives of the World Church, the executive, executive Committee, and other bodies that reflect the biblical view on human sexuality, including statements on homosexuality and transgenderism. I encourage you to read these biblically-based official statements, which are available on the church's website at adventist.org slash hyphen official statements slash. We are to show Christian respect to all people, but God calls us through his strength to follow his created plan for human sexuality. According to scripture, individuals are created only male or female. And we are to adhere only to what the Bible says in lifestyle and practice. Adultery, fornication, and LGBTQIA plus are in direct opposition to God's law and heavenly plan for human sexuality we must make a conscious choice, even though unpopular, to speak up for Bible truth and not simply go along with societal trends. I encourage you to allow Bible-based groups like Coming Out Ministries to point people to the Bible and God's power to overcome sin according to his word. Number 13, rejection of temperance versus God's comprehensive health ministry and health reform. There are those who advocate unhealthy lifestyles, including the use of alcohol, which is destructive to mind and to body. It has even been suggested that substances such as marijuana can enhance spirituality since other religions have used it. Fight against these violations of Christian temperance. L lift up the banner of temperance against any form of mind-altering substance, including all forms of alcohol. The devil will use anything to distract people from God's laws of health and health reform. But God has given us enormous counsel in the Bible and spirit of prophecy for living a healthy lifestyle. Read and follow it as part of the third angel's message to stay away from anything that will defile you. My fellow leaders and church members, stay faithful to God's pure health principles according to his word. Number 14, disastrous influences of Eastern mysticism. The devil is using Eastern mysticism to bring in all sorts of syncretistic beliefs into the Seventh-day Adventist church, including pantheism and other forms of aberrant theological twisting of the word of God. Second Peter chapter two, verse one indicates, but there are also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Hebrews 13, 8 to 9 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart is established by grace. Friends, let's stay completely away from mystic beliefs and practices which fight against the wonderful belief in the overriding power of God according to his word. 
Now, my brothers and sisters, as we have reviewed these 14 points, understand these are just some of the delusions facing us. There are others. Do not be distracted by these, but rather focus fully on our hopes for the future and our reason for being as Seventh-day Adventists, according to his word. Now, in summation, let's focus on our real calling for these last days of Earth's history to proclaim the worldwide message of the three angels' messages. Revelation 14 and the corresponding fourth angel of Revelation 18 describe those precious messages. The Lord is calling us to be part of his amazing last day movement and mission. That's who Seventh-day Adventists are. Are, presenting all of God's precious truths to the world according to his word. Yes, by his grace, revitalize your work, your church, your organization through revival and reformation, pleading with the Holy Spirit to bring spiritual life to each of us and our church members. Let's earnestly pray for the falling of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit to accomplish this work. We need revival, reformation, repentance, and humility to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. Leading up to the 2022 General Conference session in St. Louis, Pray earnestly for the Holy Spirit to fall on his people and prepare us for our work. Since God formed the Seventh-day Adventist church, his remnant church, to proclaim his three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Testimonies, volume 9, page 19. A wonderful, inspiring quotation. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. That's a, just stop for a moment. Isn't that an amazing thing? On you, on the world church, we are being bathed with light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. Now get these last two sentences. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. So don't get sidetracked, preoccupied, or lose focus on why we are Seventh-day Adventists. God is calling us to proclaim these messages in a powerful way. I'm reminded of some quotes from our lead conference just ended yesterday. Uh, Pastor Chris Holland appealing to us in his devotional to be watching, to be waiting, to be warning. And that marvelous quote from John Bradshaw, where he said, you can focus on the coming crisis or on the coming Christ. What a privilege we have of sharing these messages. But unfortunately, many people do not understand them or have ignored them. And some are attempting to distort and even change the meaning of these precious messages. Now, in order to proclaim these God-given messages to the world, we must understand and accept them ourselves as leaders, as members of the executive committee, as church members. So review with me what the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy tell us about these vitally important and relevant messages for today. Now, we read in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, and you may think, well, we know all this, Pastor. Why are you going over it? I want to tell you, we cannot go over the three angels' messages enough. They are so relevant for us today. Verse 6, Then I saw 
another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Now, the very core of the three angels' messages is the righteousness of Christ, as we've said, is justifying and sanctifying righteousness. Not our righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. The foundation of the everlasting gospel is based upon Jesus Christ and his great sacrifice for us. We respond to the gospel message by becoming followers of Christ. Tomorrow, you're going to hear a marvelous testimony from Brother Ed. You'll hear his full name and who he is of how God has changed his life and he is now a follower of Christ because he's connected with Christ. You see, the everlasting gospel is eternal. The past, the present, and the future focused on Christ. We are called to preach it to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. That's why the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in 215 countries or so around the world. Now, in verse 7, it goes on saying the following. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, the, uh, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Now, this first angel proclaims with a loud voice, so everyone can hear. Always give God the glory and praise for everything, fellow leaders. Don't give praise and honor to yourself. When someone compliments you, oh, that was a great sermon, Pastor, and oh, you're doing a great work, don't say, well, thank you. That's very good. I've been spending a lot of time, so I, I, I deserve that. No, just say, praise the Lord. Now, the next text says, for the hour of his judgment has come. Yes, we are being judged. Beginning in 1844, the investigated judgment in the most holy place in heaven began as the Lord reviewed the lives of people down through history. One day, probation is going to close. So that's why it's so important to lean on Jesus every day. This judgment is also in front of the entire universe telling whether God's wonderful foundation of love is just, pure, and true. Of course, it will be shown at the end of time that everything God does is perfect. But the passage states, we are to worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. This is crucial because it ties into the third angel's message, signifying that God is the all-powerful creator. We are to worship him not only in spirit and truth, but on the day that he has asked us to worship him, the seventh day Sabbath, the sign of his authority. And it is the seventh day today and always has been and will be the sabbath has not been lost the seventh day sabbath will become one of the great controversial topics in the last days it is in complete opposition to the mark of the beast because the seal of god is the keeping of the seventh day sabbath the time will come to make the ultimate decision of who to worship by indicating where our loyalties lie with God by worshiping him on the day he has indicated, the holy seventh-day Sabbath, regardless of the consequences, or by following the beast who has set up his false day of worship. It is at that time when that choice has to be made, that those who choose to keep Sunday will receive the mark of the beast. For the mark of the beast is the keeping of Sunday, the beast's false day of worship. Now, listen to what Great Controversy says on page 604, plainly stating, when with the issue that thus clearly brought before him, Whoever shall trample upon God's law 
to obey a human enactment receives the mark of the beast. Now it goes on to say on page 605 the following. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty for it is the point of truth especially controverted or, 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 or discussed or, or uh, disagreed on. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. Clearly, the seal of God is connected with the keeping of the seventh day Sabbath as holy, as we rely on the Lord, allowing his justifying and sanctifying power to work in us, bringing glory to him. My friends, the great controversy, the book, is a marvelous book. During the last days, many incredible supernatural events will be happening. This powerful book pulls aside the curtain, warning us of what lies ahead. I believe every word in this book, the great controversy. I support it and promote it, the full and complete copy of the great controversy. As you know, at the 2020 annual council in this room, we overwhelmingly voted to have the great controversy be the missionary book of the year for the two years of 2023 and 2024. The plan is called the Great Controversy Project 2.0. And the goal is to distribute around the world millions upon millions of this very relevant, life-changing book in hard copies and electronic downloads. This is not just some uniform mass mailing project, but rather a personal outreach project where we are inviting all pastors, members, leaders, young people, all Seventh-day Adventists to become personally involved in sharing this book with their friends, neighbors, coworkers, communities, and online. Although some copies will certainly be mailed, the vast majority of books will be hand-delivered as well as downloaded electronically. Truly, we know the most effective way to share literature is by personal outreach. So we encourage everyone to become personally involved with this Missionary Book of the Year project. You can begin right now. You don't have to wait till 2023. Please strongly support and participate in this program. Ellen White said the great controversy was the book she wished circulated more than any other book she had written because it has such great truth, beginning with the early Christian church to the end of time. An incredible description of what will happen in the end is found on page 624. Listen to this incredible prediction. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by 
anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people, and then, in his assumed character of Christ, assumed character, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. Can you imagine the deception and unbelievable delusion that will take place? We will not be able to believe even what we see or hear. We can only believe what we read in the Bible according to his word. As we know, when Jesus returns, the Bible says it, every eye will see him, not just a few. Now, continuing in the great controversy, and this is where it comes down to you and to me. It says, he, that is Satan, declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. And my friends, urge our church members and the world not to be deceived. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus, on his holy word, and that which he is calling us to proclaim. Now, continuing in Revelation, we read in chapter 14, verse 8. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, this is the church down through the Middle Ages that continues today led by the papacy. It will, according to Bible prophecy, unite with apostate Protestantism and spiritualism to form the triumvirate attempting to force submission on all who faithfully follow the word of God. Babylon, a symbol of complete confusion, chaos, and the mixing of truth and error is fallen because it represents the devil and satanic influences confusing people. The Great Controversy, page 588, says, through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul, that false lie of the devil that something lives beyond death, and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. You know, my friends, the belief of the immortality of the soul is nearly universal. But what a comfort to know the truth about death, that our loved ones are merely sleeping until Jesus comes. As many of you know, one of our precious grandsons, James, precious little picture of him there. He was a sweet little guy, almost eight years old died a few months ago from Alexander disease, a very rare and fatal neurodegenerative disease. Now on June 8th, the very day that little James died, we as a family, including Elizabeth, our daughter, and David, our son-in-law, put James in the ground. It was a simple burial in a family cemetery in western North Carolina where my father-in-law, mother-in-law, and sister-in-law are already buried. As we sang hymns of the blessed hope, even in the rain, we put James in the ground in his casket that was actually made by his father. James is simply sleeping, as Jesus said. When the Lord returns with a shout, and the trumpet, 
As 1 Thessalonians 4.16 tells us, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then James will come alive and we will ascend to meet Jesus. What a joyous experience that will be. He will again be placed in the arms, that's James, of his mother Elizabeth and his father David. We believe that when Jesus comes, he will put life back into those who have died in him. And I'm sure you, too, are looking forward to being reunited with dear ones who have gone to sleep in Jesus. We do not believe in the immortality of the soul, but the devil tries to bring that deception in to cause confusion and open the door to spiritualism, which will be combined with the Roman power and apostate Protestantism, forming uh, an amazing union to confuse people. It is Babylon. Now, continuing in the Great Controversy, page 588, through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this, of this threefold union, this country will follow in this step of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. Friends, this is not a conditional prophecy. It is rock solid confirming Revelation 13 and 14. You can be sure these events will happen. Now the United States, and I praise God for what this country has been, and I am a citizen of this country, and I thank God for the rights and the privileges of being a citizen. But this country, represented by the two-horned beast of Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, will repudiate the very foundations upon which it was founded. The two horns represent republicanism, not the party, but the form of government termed a republic, and the other horn representing Protestantism. This two-horned beast will create an image to the original beast through a national Sunday law, which will become universal. The image to the beast is an entity that will pattern its religious understanding after the characteristics of the beast. Now, we're told on page 445 of the Great Controversy that the image to the beast is apostate Protestantism working unitedly with the government of the United States in forcing the union of church and state as the beast has done and will do. Praise God for separation of church and state that we enjoy in this country and in other countries at this moment. Use the time wisely and proactively. Revelation 13 verse 12 states, and the he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. This clearly shows that the image to the beast, the United States combined with apostate Protestantism, will initiate activities to support the beast and a national Sunday law. And as the scripture says, will make the whole earth to worship the beast whose deadly wound is healed. Since 1929, when the state of the Vatican City or the Holy See was established, the papal power has grown in strength not only in religious areas but in geopolitical settings. We can be sure there will be national and international Sunday laws that will deprive all true Bible-believing Christians of the religious liberty and freedom of conscience that we value so much. Do not believe anyone, pastor, theologian, 
scholar, church member, teacher, anyone who may tell you Sunday laws will not be enacted. That's an absolute falsehood, my friends. They will be enacted. We read in Testimonies, Volume 4, page 595, ministers who have preached the truth with all zeal and earnestness may apostatize and join the ranks of our enemies. But does this turn the truth of God into a lie? Nevertheless, says the apostle, the foundation of God standeth sure. The faith and feelings of men may change, but the truth of God never. The third angel's message is sounding. It is infallible. The devil, his supporters, and his false day of worship will appear to have triumphed, but it will not last long. God's great sign of his authority as creator, the seventh day Sabbath will be the seal on his people and will triumph forever when Jesus returns to take his people home to heaven. Make no mistake about what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy clearly indicate about last day events and prophecy. The final prophetic fulfillment is coming soon. Revelation 9 and 10 they go on to say, Then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Receiving this mark in the forehead represents a conscious acceptance and belief of the beast's instructions. Receiving the mark in the hand represents that even in, if you may not believe the instructions, you will sacrifice your eternal life simply to temporarily save your life. As we know, Bible prophecy indicates clearly that the beast is the papacy. This historical understanding was accepted by many Protestant reformers long before the Seventh-day Adventist Church existed. And of course, we also accept this teaching based on a careful study of scripture and history. While we are counseled in the book Evangelism by Ellen White, not to unnecessarily provoke those in the Roman church, it is important that we as leaders and our members know and understand that we believe and are willing to share in a kindly and straightforward way our beliefs. We are not anti-Catholic. We care about the salvation of everyone and we'll find ways of sharing these all important truths with as many as possible while there is still time. We read this straightforward counsel in Spiritual Gifts, volume two, page 284. Preachers should have no scruples to preach the truth as it is found in God's word. Let the truth cut. I have been shown that why ministers have not more success is they are afraid of hurting feelings, fearful of not being courteous, and they lower the standard of truth and conceal, if possible, the peculiarity of our faith. I saw that God could not make such successful. The truth must be made pointed and the necessity of a decision urged. And as false shepherds are crying peace and are preaching smooth things, the servants of God must cry aloud and spare not, leaving the result with God. In Last Day Events, page 224, we read the following. And I say this kindly and with careful love, but it's the truth. The mark of the beast is the papal Sabbath. When the test comes, it will be clearly shown what the mark of the beast is. It is the keeping of Sunday. 
the sign or seal of God is revealed in the observance of the seventh day Sabbath, the Lord's memorial of creation. The mark of the beast is the opposite of this, the observance of the first day of the week. I want to tell you, my fellow leaders, I believe every word of this explanation from the spirit of prophecy, and I hope you do too. Don't allow anyone to distract you from Bible and spirit of prophecy truth. Are we and our people ready for what is coming? Lean on Christ and his word. Ponder this from Last Day Events, page 136. The whole world is to be stirred with enmity against Seventh-day Adventists because they will not yield homage to the papacy by honoring Sunday, the institution of this anti-Christian power. Are you ready for that? Am I? Continuing on page 137 from Last Day Events, all Christendom will be divided into two great classes, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus and those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. Both of these quotations are very sobering. You see, the three angels' messages end with marvelous verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. By God's grace and power, let's keep all the commandments of God. Let's have complete faith in Jesus, who is our righteousness. As we proclaim those three angels' messages, the Holy Spirit will guide our church to be unified in its approach. In Principles for Christian Leaders, page 306, and this is a powerful quote, we read the following. His transforming grace upon human hearts will lead to unity that has not yet been realized. For all who are assimilated to Christ will be in harmony with one another. The Holy Spirit will create unity. I am instructed to say to Seventh-day Adventists, the world over, all over the world, God has called us as a people to be a peculiar treasure until himself. He has appointed that his church on earth shall stand perfectly united what? By actions we take? By our professed belief? No. Perfectly united in the spirit and counsel of the Lord of hosts to the end of time. When the powerful injunctions of the third angel are proclaimed, there will be highly unusual responses. On page 307 of the same book, we note, Heretofore, those who presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been re regarded as mere alarmists. Their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control in the United States, that church and state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God, have been pronounced groundless and absurd. It has been confidently declared that this land could never become other than what it has been, the defender of religious freedom. But as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching. And the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. So my brothers and sisters, and I recognized and I said it at the beginning, this was a somewhat lengthy pastoral message. We need to know what we're facing. As we share God's three angels' messages, I encourage you as leaders, as church members, number one, study deeply and believe the three angels' messages personally and allow them to transform your heart. Number two, allow God's spirit to fill you with a deep Christ-like love for everyone as you share these messages. Number three, use biblically based methods to share every aspect of the three angels' messages. 
Of course, we're not to go around beating people over the head with this message, but we are to share these messages with love and hope. The three angels' messages not only have strong warning, but great hope through the righteousness of Christ as revealed in the everlasting gospel. You know the story of Isaiah in chapter 6, telling of the uh, amazement in God's throne room and feeling how Isaiah felt very inadequate. But the Lord's angel touched Isaiah's lips with a live coal, symbolizing the cleansing of his sin. And in Isaiah 6, 8, God asked, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? The Godhead. Isaiah immediately responded, Here am I, send me. In essence, Isaiah said, I will go. As you all know, the Seventh-day Adventists' strategic plan for this quinquennium has the theme, Reach the World, I Will Go. God wants each of us to be involved in his last day saving proclamation of the three angels' messages. He invites us to respond to him by saying, yes, Lord, you've given us these three angels' messages and the fourth angel of Revelation 18. Lord, use me. Here I am. I will go and share these messages according to his word. And one day, very soon, we're going to look up in the eastern sky and See a small cloud approaching about half the size of a man's hand, we're told. We will realize it is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That cloud will get brighter and brighter and larger and larger and all of heaven poured out for this climactic event. And in the middle of that cloud, we will see Jesus. We will say, this is the God that we have waited for, and he will save us. And Jesus will look down and say, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy of your Lord, and we will ascend to heaven together. I long for that day. We'll see little James again, by God's grace. You'll see your loved ones who have died in the Lord. But the most important thing is we will see Jesus. You'll look around and you'll see those whom you've invited because you said, yes, Lord, I will go and be part of God's last day message to this world. My dear brothers and sisters, whether you are watching on Zoom, whether you're seeing it live streaming, whether you're here in the auditorium, if you want to commit yourself to Christ and proclaim his last day, three angels' messages through Holy Spirit power as we approach the impending conflict and Christ's soon coming, would you join me in standing in commitment to the Lord and his word right now? Amen. Let's pray. Our loving Father in heaven, we are humbled by the fact that we can speak to you directly through prayer. We're your children, your sons and daughters, by the grace of Jesus Christ, through creation and through redemption. And now we await your continued empowerment on us to fill us with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, please send the latter rain of the Holy Spirit to fall upon your church. Revive us, reform us, help us to repent and in all humility to submit to you. For what we face in the future has very little resemblance to the difficulties and pandemic that we have just gone through and are going through. Because the future will seem very bleak and difficult. But Lord, we have read your prophetic word. And we know what to expect. And we know upon whom we can count on the mighty power of Jesus Christ. So as we submit ourselves to you now, leaders, 
church members. We ask that you will help us to defend your holy word, that the Holy Spirit will help us to help our, not only church members, but the world know the Bible truth. That yes, we will be watching and waiting and we will also be warning and giving power to the word of God, not by our own power, but because the Holy Spirit speaks through us to help people prepare for that climactic day when Jesus will return. We thank you for this. We ask all of this in the name of our creator, our redeemer, our master teacher, our master physician, our coming king, and our best friend, Jesus Christ. Amen. May God be with you and may you have a wonderful Sabbath as you leave this place saying, yes, Lord, I will.